Hey, BC, we've been talking about Coach Coach White and, and Coach Knight and uh, the pressures yesterday, and, and weird, they're kind of in lockstep because I think it's it's what they're immersed in in terms of of, of the, the the standard around there. But how do you think they know when to transition from coach led to player led? Because we talk about this whole thing, and and they talk about it all the time. Whether it's the three different teams, or you know, teaching techniques, or expounding upon last year, like where they want ownership and the players to take ownership, but they themselves know it's their job to can still continue to make sure they instill the end product. Yeah, that's probably a fine balance there. I think it helps when you see players, um, you know, telling other guys that's, that's not good enough. Like that's not, that's not what it's supposed to look like. That's not how we tackle. That's not how this drill works. And the interesting thing was Tony White was actually, I think, giving that answer to a question about like what, uh, recruits what like what he thinks rec- will take away from watching Nebraska practices and I know from doing those interviews recruits are very impressed by like how together um, they've already got it like within what people know what to do but that is a big part of it I would imagine it's not just how the coaches are um, doing their business and they know what they're doing it's that uh, these recruits are looking around and they're seeing what you're talking about where it's a it's players it's nash it's not it's guys even you know lesser in experience than nash who've been around at least a little bit telling another guy um no no we we can do more like this this is what it's supposed to look like and you've got guys comparing notes after drills and stuff like that i think that's um when as a coach you you start to think you got something you you don't want to you don't want to just rest on that obviously you got to keep pushing it um, and they are. I like the fact that yesterday it was stressed. You know, yeah, we want to be the number one defense, of course, but uh, it's words. That's words. We got to we got to go put out all the work. And I think there's been things that have stuck in Tony's craw. Uh, you would know probably better than I, um, even though they were good last year in top 10 in a lot of statistics. You can see stuff like third down defense, and certain aspects or, or specific drives within the season, like the Maryland drive after you, t- you know, after. Uh, mm. even though there was the interception in the end zone, we always talk about that, but that was, a, you know, Nebraska, very good defense gives up 70 yards there all of a sudden yep. and then and, and losing a field goal. And there are those specific drives. There's the play at the end of the Iowa game. You shut them down for 59 minutes, 40 seconds, and then you let the, the uh, leaky run happen, you know, set up a field goal that inches over the crossbar, all that stuff you can put in front of your guys still. And say, yeah, there were some. You did some okay stuff, but um, what's great football look like? What's championship ball look like? And it, it, you, you can put those specific things in front of guys. And I, and I think the good thing is the the players are starting to do that themselves. So I know some people get tired of the whole culture conversation in the off season. Um, you know, they always feel like Nebraska wins at the culture conversation, not in the games, but you got to start there. You, you have to have that, to have that chance. And I think they're, they're off to a promising start as you'd expect on the defensive side with all the experience they've got coming back. We're talking with Brian Christopherson from Husker 24 uh, seven BC. So I know you were, uh, you know, you mentioned all the experience coming back on the defensive side. Does that make it easier on that side of the ball to trust and to, get that standard adopted by the players because they were successful last year versus on the offensive side of the ball, where obviously you've got a lot more new pieces and a lot more question marks as to the kind of efficacy of what you were doing. Um, It might a little bit uh, with, with the defensive guys. I mean, they've definitely seen Tony White's system works and now it's just like, let's take it to the next level. Um, I think the thing the defensive guys really appreciate about Tony's system when you hear him talk is it, it lets them play. It's not like it's just they're out on the you know, schoolyard or anything, but it's it's built to sort of, um, you know, maximize guys being creative and, and I think being able to uh, sometimes um, on the fly uh, do some things that they couldn't under the previous scheme. So, but yeah, anytime you have success, you're like, okay, that works. I'm going to, uh, when that coach tells me something, I know that that's paid off against Wisconsin or it's paid off in this situation, and uh, it's got to be of use. On the offensive side, um, there's 
so many different new pieces. Maybe that helps a little bit with what you're asking because you've got new quarterbacks. You've got some different, um, you know, wide receiver pieces mixing in and at running back and all that um, with Dowdell and all these different guys. I just think, um, you know, there's some new flavor over there too. And, you know, Coach Thomas is working with the QBs. Um, maybe that um, also helps a little bit as you get going into a new year, getting guys think, okay, this is a different start. We've got some new personnel. We kind of know what our weaknesses were from last season. Let's start chopping wood. Yeah. It, listening to you say that is kind of interesting going to the offensive side of the ball, because for all the, the, the new and, and attempting to win a job like at wide out at, you know, uh, running back at quarterback, the one constant, and I sometimes have to pinch myself, is the offensive line. That's an incredible amount of starts potentially for this group coming back. And it almost seems like it happened overnight. Is that shame on us? Or did you see the plan kind of developing to be patient with some of this continuity? No, I mean, they've, they've worked at it a while, and then you get a guy like Ben Scott at center, and that makes you feel better about that. Obviously, what Bryce did at right tackle um, and how he changed his body last season, I think, uh, kind of lifted everybody a little bit because that was one of the prime examples around here. We've talked for so long about, oh, you got to develop. What about the develop word? And Bryce was one of those guys, if we're honest, who for three years, we I, I kind of placed him in that category of some guys who have come and gone through this program where it's like, we saw something in them and they kind of stayed the same. It leveled off. Mm -hmm. But then last year you saw that jump. You saw that he had a different body, um, you know, through the strength and conditioning program and how it helped them in that flexibility. Um, and so that made you feel good about right tackle. Now you see Teddy, you know, who I think has leaned out and kind of has a little bit of that Bryce look to him uh, on the other side um, from his off season work. And you kind of hope that with a full year of, let's knock on wood and hope but of good health what that can look like um so they've just done a good job recruiting it um i think where i mean for several cycles i've looked at the linemen i've thought this should work on paper but you just got to keep getting guys a little bit better every year and you know donovan riola deserves a lot of credit uh for how they're trending they got to get but let's not throw a parade or anything yet i thought they were good last year but they they were okay last year but they've got to take that next step but i definitely do think he's got people um believing in in what he teaches his technique and those guys would pretty much do anything for him they would tell you that and so when you've got a a room like that of guys who are three four star guys uh they've got the talent within them they believe in their coach um you've got a you got a formula that you would hope was going to help this group take the next step this year. BC, how much does it say about how much that offensive line group has grown that there's a, a, a basically a full-time SEC starter in the room that was basically an afterthought? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't think he's going to be when it's all said and done, but I know what you're you saying. Mean in like, his yeah. You mean in the acquisition of him? The acquisition of him yeah. and just the way people are talking about the offensive line now. Like, nobody's talking about Mazuka, <laughs> right? Like, that's a guy that, that was an SEC starter last year. Well, he started year. in two conferences, power five yeah. conferences. Yeah, but I mean, last year was an SEC starter, and, like, we're talking about Ben Hard and Prohaska, as well we should, right? But, like, that is, like, two years ago, if Nebraska had brought in a SEC starter. We were hoping Norelli could come back and after a year suspension and contribute. Yeah, You're talking about that yes. the stark contrast? Like, that, yeah. like, in two years, this is crazy that we barely even are acknowledging that there's an sec starter in the room that was acquired this offseason i think we're sec yeah. burned and that, yeah and i maybe what you're saying robbie we're, we're not talking about it like this guy has to be yeah like a savior um, like yeah he has to definitely be it like they, there's hope that it's going to be that way and the depth looks a lot better if that's the case but you're right but they if he doesn't start with, does anybody care um, there'd be some disappointment, but your point is well taken. I think, you know, it's one of those deals where they feel like there's like seven or eight other names right now where you could say, ah, he could be a starter. What about Corcoran? What are they going to do with him? You know, when he's fully healthy, um, they, like they what if Latofsky takes a jump, right? Like, and be, I think exactly. people would be thrilled. 
Yeah, Latofsky and Justin Evans are guys people have to keep in mind there. And then, of course, you've got your your crew from last cycle, your Sam Sledges, mm-hmm. your Gunnar Gatulas. And if you know one of those guys even kind of makes it in the rotation, you've already got it up to seven or eight. So, yeah, that that's a, a fair point. Um, and also, I mean, I think Mizuka is going to be a part of it when it's all said and done. I was actually, you know, when he said the first thing about him in January or February, I, I was sort of in that mode where it's like, you know, I've seen him kind of challenge guys before, mm-hmm. um, and it's worked out. It's Tommy Hill is a good example, but let's let's just let this play out. And then the way he talked about him the last press conference, it, it's still building. Like, you still got work to cover, um, but you could tell, um, you know, like he, when he gets on the field, they see why he started games at Florida last year and all that stuff. So I, I still think he's going to have a big say in it, but – it's a good point that we're not we're not doing the thing we have done some years where we spend every day talking about Micah Mazuka or this one guy you know who came in from the portal and it, it is more of a uh, position group or team emphasis in almost all these discussions honestly. Yeah, I, and and shame on me because I'm normally the guy that's like stay right here, mm-hmm. like stay right here, stay in the moment. Let's go second to second, but kind of i've allowed myself and maybe it's because of this year's recruiting class maybe it's because this court this crop of quarterbacks are young maybe still because he only has second year wide receivers maybe it's because you say gatula and sledge maybe it's because he's got some young pieces in the secondary bc i don't have to think very hard at all or have it be a stretch that the best roster will be next year and not this year and that's what you want in a coach in what say, and I'm not bypassing year two, obviously, but year three, like, I think it's kind of uh, cool, I guess. That's kind of a dumb word, but <laughs> it, it's fascinating that on paper, it's shaping up to be that way already. Yeah. Um, I, I know you probably that. haven't liked I'm just saying like the young, look at the youth. Mm-hmm. But they still have depth. Yeah. Offensive side in the ball in particular, I, I think that way. I, I could give it talked into it on the defense too, although I really like the personnel some of the, with some of the vets they have this year. But you're that that's a, that's true though, what you're saying. Um like you you do see that um what was it, the the team in twenty one that they had that finished three and nine, the best three and nine, nine team ever, you know. <laughs> like I, I felt like that defense um was really fun to watch and it was a hard playing unit but you also saw like this has an expiration date a little bit because there were so many of those guys who had been super seniors and they were leaving and you couldn't you didn't quite know who was going to patch up what some people left behind or how long that was going to take um and what you're talking about i do see there's more possibilities or options and it's not just like one guy behind who the starter is right now. There's like two or three names at some spots where you're like, yeah, maybe he's going to be the guy in a year. Like, like a like a year uh, three, a year three, Cam Lenhart, a, a year three, yeah, Buford, a, and you're maybe more excited. A, a year two, Tarver, like you're maybe like, more excited about the guys coming <laughs> than the guys that are currently starting. Yeah, that secondary could be lights out in two years. Yeah, they they they've they've got a lot of potential back there. They, they've they've. I thought like when I walked around on Thursday and we we're just taking little pictures or whatever, uh, the secondary was the one I was like, okay, that's like how it's supposed to look. Now let's see w- how it translates. And if you've got, you know, eight to 10, you feel confident about by the time you get to the fall. But like, I mean, even Bly Hill, like you see him out there and just his length and it's just like, man, that's, that's, that's right. That's a nice picture. So, um, I, I do like what they've done. Um, in stacking and so is rule i mean rule when you t- you've heard him in interviews he's like i like how our team looks when they're out on the field like it looks like it's kind of supposed to look and now it's just you got to keep keep them going and pushing them with the football part and um you know keep them inspired that the whatever happened yesterday was is the new standard then it's got to be better the next day and that's what i think what they're trying to get across this spring and, and i say that not to fast forward i say that to say his ability to be consistent in how he builds is remarkable because it's not like we're keeping track of this. I just happened to think about it because 
I have a kid that I hope red shirts, right? So it, it forced me to kind of take a look at, and it didn't force me, but just on a, on the humbug, I'm mm -hmm. like, all right, you got a, you got a young, you got two young quarterbacks. You've got young wide receivers. I'm looking at the depth of the O-line. Gatul and Sledge and those guys haven't played. Then I hopped over to the defense. I'm like, you know what? I bet they're recruiting because I've kind of heard this pitch. I, you know, I heard him when they, when they talked to, to Abel or to Christian, it's like, do you know how we win more games? We get better players, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, don't not, worry about whether we're going to win or not. We're going to win. We need, guy, we need guys like you. I, but he said that, BC, and I was like, you know what? I need to take a look at this because they have really started to stack the cupboard, and they're improving real time on the fly. That's ideal. Yeah, I'm I'm encouraged by how it looks on paper. I always I always want to be cautious because right. like I'll use a I'll use wide receiver as an example, uh, Damon. I I've for years talked myself in the spring <laughs> to like like I'll look I'll look at the names and I'll be like, oh man, they yeah they they got like eight or nine guys there, and then it'll be some game in October, early November. You're out there and it's like late third quarter, and you're kind of looking at the pieces. And you're like, they got like two or three guys that you really trust right now. And then someone comes up like Billy Kemp's hobbled or something. And you're like, oh, man, where, where does this go now? And so I agree with you what you're saying and like how it's setting up to be. And then I try to like always knock it down a little bit with that. Like, OK, but let's like I thought the D-line did a very good job of that last year of knocking away. Right, right before our very eyes. Mm -hmm. We, we yeah. were panicking like crazy in the offseason about the D-line. And then you watch the Minnesota game, and they're up to 19 guys playing already, and you're like, huh, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like halfway <laughs> through the second quarter. And that's what the O-line, and I, I think the O-line was getting there. Uh, that's why when some people are saying, okay, you're really you're trumpeting the O-line a little bit for what they've done so far. Um, I would agree like from what they've accomplished as far as stats and some things, um, but I, I – I'm kind of connecting it to the conversation you're talking about where I do start to see with the O-line where you feel like it's more than just like five guys. Now you feel like um, there could be options where there could be about eight or nine that you feel pretty good about. But beyond that, then you could look a year or so ahead on O-line and say, okay, when these two or three guys move on, these two or three guys are going to step in and then they'll be part of the seven or eight man rotation. So I think you're starting to see that that is, it's there. Like you can see the, uh, the road to that. They just got to keep, uh, they got to keep making hay and, and, and make it a reality. I hate to say this out loud, BC, cause we're up against it, but that sounds a lot like the totem pole in the pecking order when you know it's a grown man league and the players are mm -hmm. willing to accept that their time may not be year one, mm -hmm. but year two, that part, you know, I can definitely identify with. Yeah. That's a good topic too, is getting those guys to understand that they're, you know, just a year away or two and have that patience. That's Brian Christopherson, Husker 24-7. Great stuff as always, BC. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, B. Yep. Thanks, guys.